Well, good evening, everyone. I am so excited to join you for this webinar. I want to thank Anna Heck and my friends at MSU uh, for inviting me. And I want to give a shout out, if you're out there, to my friends Chris Beck and Rich Whiskey from MBA. Um, so as Anna said, my name is Stephanie Slater, and I entered my first honey show in 2019. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but with some dumb luck, I received a second place at the Wisconsin State Fair. Now I was hooked, and I had to start doing everything I could to learn more about how to improve as a competitor. And just a few months ago, I became the first person from the state of Wisconsin to be certified as a honey judge through the American Honey Show Training Council. I am going to share lots of information with you tonight on how you can prepare for your upcoming honey show. I hope that all of you will consider entering in at least one of the classes in March. I do have lots of slides, so I'm going to get started so that we have time for all your questions afterwards. Um, but Anna's going to go ahead and monitor the chat. So if you have a, a good question, they'll go ahead and interrupt me as well, okay? So a lot of people ask, well, why? Why do we exhibit? Well, healthy competition is great for, for everyone. It just raises the bar. Um, as competitors, we definitely learn more. We can learn more from other competitors. We can learn from the judges. We can educate our audience. Think about those spectators that are walking through your county or state fairs, seeing all of our beautiful hive products on display. They might not have any idea what we're doing as beekeepers, and this is an ideal opportunity to help educate them more. Bragging rights are priceless. We have lots of fun amongst our friends and family um, bragging about that blue ribbon that we received. But you know, that marketing help showing those ribbons on the table or adding an extra sticker to your jar are gonna show your customers uh, that you have a premium product and it's proven by that ribbon that you won. And honestly, it is just fun. I really enjoy honey shows and uh, Anna is hooked now too, so I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, really what this is all about is your bees, your bees created a perfect product, okay? And it's your job to present it in its best light. So the purpose of a honey show is to teach you to be a better producer and then make better quality products for your customers. So the first um, piece of advice that I have for you or the first um, um, recommendation I have is make sure you read the rules. Read them several times, print them, highlight them, hang them on the fridge, follow them carefully because sometimes there might be just the tiniest of things um, that would cause one person to lose a point and cause you then to rise above because you didn't lose a point. So every honey show will be different. There will be different rules and different classes, but tonight's presentation is focused solely on how you can prepare for your honey show that's happening on March 1st and 2nd. So Anna's gonna drop the link in the chat um, to the rules for that particular honey show. As you can see on the screen, I do have kind of the overview, the honey show rules, but there are specific rules to each class that you're going to want to read carefully. And I'm going to review quite a few of them with you this evening. It's really important to read the rules early and check on some things well in advance because it will help you as you're preparing your entries. So make sure that you know the date and time and location of the event. Who is the show open to? Do you need to be a member of an organization or do you need to be a paid conference attendee in order to participate? Does the exhibitor need to be present in order to submit an entry or can someone just turn it in for you? Check-in and pickup times are really important. Obviously, you don't wanna miss the check-in time. You've gone through all this work to prepare a beautiful entry and then not be able to enter it because you have the time wrong. And then you do need to know how many items are required for an exhibit. For example, you need to have three pounds of honey for um, your extracted honey class. Well, you want to make sure that you know that up front so that you're preparing enough of them in order to be ready to exhibit. So we're going to start off by talking about extracted honey. I feel like that's the one that all of us beekeepers can enter. Um, we should all be able to find three pounds of our beautiful honey to be able to enter. Even if we didn't make any comb honey last year to be able to enter in March, maybe that's something we can think about for this summer for next year's event. So when we talk about um, judging or, or entering a liquid honey entry, the judge really evaluates things like uniformity of jars, lids, and color of the honey, cleanliness of the jars and lids, the fill level, cleanliness and clarity of the honey, 
the moisture content, aroma, and flavor. So knowing that those are the things that the judge is going to evaluate, that will help you prepare your entry um, so that all of those things are, are where they should be. So the judge is looking for those three C's, cleanliness, consistency, and confirmation to the rule. Exhibits are penalized for smears, smudges, fingerprints, watermarks, honey drips, sticky spots, dirt, lint, anything that looks unclean. Sanitation or cleanliness is the most important aspect of showing honey. Cleanliness is the first consideration when judging begins. All the stuff that I mentioned, this is all stuff on the outside of the jar. We haven't looked at the honey yet. So all entries are inspected visually for contamination, which may include such things as dirt, dust, fingerprints, or other stains or smudges. The entire jar is inspected from lid to bottom. Many otherwise good honey submissions have been disqualified at this point in the judging due to sanitation problems. So really what a judge is looking for is that all of the exhibits were properly harvested, processed, packaged, and handled. So exhibits can be penalized for bee parts, pollen, wax, bubbles, dirt, lint, debris, anything visible in the honey. So once an entry has passed the external examination, close examination of the honey itself begins. A really bright flashlight or a polariscope is used to look inside the honey. Shining the light through the honey will illuminate surprisingly small defects in cleanliness and clarity of the honey. At this stage, the judge is looking for foreign items such as bee parts, lint, hair, and crystallization. Any of these things will normally disqualify an entry or at the very least cause you to lose a lot of points and kind of um, bring you out of the serious competition of maybe getting that red or blue ribbon. Exhibits are only penalized for off aromas. So does your honey smell like smoke, vigo? Did the judge smell Windex, soap, or chemicals or anything that should not be there? So Think about those things when you're preparing that jar. Make sure that there isn't something like Windex or smoke or chemicals on that glass that you were making nice and clean to get those fingerprints off. The aroma of extracted honey can tell a lot about its overall quality. Off odors can be an indication of either internal or external contamination. For example, a fermented odor probably indicates that the honey's moisture content was too high when it was packaged. A burnt or scorched or order, order means the honey was heated for a long period of time or at too high of a temperature. So gently warming your honey is absolutely an acceptable way to help clear it and get some of those bubbles out, but just be careful not to overdo it. The best time to smell the honey is when the jar is first opened. So that's what the judge is going to do. So let's talk about jars and fill lines. So what you see here on the screen on the top are your two types of glass jars, the classic gamber jar on the left and the queen line jar that has that wider shoulder and wider mouth. Either one of those are perfectly acceptable for a honey show as long as they're glass. You can, um, you can use any type of lid, plastic or metal, just as long as they match and that they're in good shape, which means no dents, scratches, um, rust, anything like that, okay? So um, down on the bottom of this uh, image, I wanna talk about the fill line and the fill ring. And this was something that was a little challenging for me. In fact, it still is a little challenging for me. So I want to um, illustrate this for you a little easier. So the fill ring is directly above the shoulder and directly below the threads. So this first, ring or bead is the fill line. So it's horizontal, it's not slanted like your thread. So although sometimes people think it's a thread, it's not. Same thing is illustrated on this different type of jar. Above the shoulder, below the threads, we've got our fill ring. So that is where you want to fill your honey to that fill ring. You want to make sure that you can't see any air between the top of the honey and the bottom of the lid. So we wanna make sure our customers feel that they got everything they paid for, that they got a full jar of honey, so it doesn't look underfilled. So that's why that fill ring is there. 
So here's another illustration of a comparison. So this darker honey here on the left, this is correctly filled. It's right up to that fill line. This honey in the middle, this is underfilled. You can see where the top of that honey is just under that fill ring. And then this one that's further on the right, the lightest honey, this is overfilled slightly. I will tell you that I find the lighter the honey, the harder it is to really see where that fill line is. I find that my eyes play tricks on me. I probably need some glasses. So this is something that um, takes a little time and be patient. Um, but it's important, get it filled to the fill line and make sure every single one of those three jars that you're turning in for your entry is filled at the exact same spot. So preparing your exhibits or preparing two exhibits. Time is your friend. Start in advance. The more, the further out that you work ahead of the honey show, the less stressful things are going to be for you, okay? So as I mentioned, you can gently warm your honey, but not heat it, okay? So the honey will flow nicer and the bubbles will rise up more quickly if you warm it, but just be careful not to overheat it. Every time you heat it or warm it, you are changing that color a little bit. And that can be really rough on your really light honeys. So let's talk about um, harvesting our honey that we want to um, exhibit in a honey show. You want to think about using a skateboard, shaking or brushing, or using a blower to get the bees off the frames. Don't use smoke to clear the bees from the supers because it can put tiny black specks in the honey and on the surface of your comb honey. In the extracted honey, those specks can end up on the underside of your lids. Too much smoke can cause the honey to smell smoky. If you're using a fume board, don't leave it on too long or don't use too much of that bee go because your honey may absorb those objectionable odors. So that humectant property of the honey will take in odors from the um, environment. So I always like to tell the story that I learned from another honey judge. Um, they couldn't figure out why, why a particular entry kind of tasted like rubber band. And so after the honey show was all over, they found the exhibitor and, and, and chatted with him. And it turns out that he was bottling his honey in his basement right next to where he repaired bike tires. So think about those things when you're handling and bottling your honey. Now, certainly you wouldn't want your customers to taste rubber band tasting honey. And we definitely don't want that for a honey show. So just keep that in mind when you're bottling your honey. So when you are extracting that honey that you've very carefully um, harvested from the hives, you can warm the comb slightly and spin at your lowest speed. You can hang your strainer near the base of the bucket. As you fill with honey, slowly pull that strainer towards the top. If that strainer is too high in the pail, that honey just falls like rain to the bottom of the pail and it just adds so much air. And that's just more work and time that you need in order to get those bubbles out for a honey show. Again, make sure you fill your jars correctly. Um, you must cover the fill line, but not go over. And again, all of those jars should be filled at the same level. So this, this um, sentence I got from a training that I just took recently. So this, this honey judge said, um, the top of the meniscus of the honey should touch the top of the fill bead. So honey is got this concave shape. So the top of that meniscus should touch the top of the fill bead. So hopefully that helps. It was different perspective. And so I wanted to make sure that I, I added that to this presentation. And we talked about, make sure you use matching jars and matching lids. The lids can be metal or plastic and they can be any color. They just need to match. The tamper-proof seals and then that uh, little styrofoam seal that's up in the plastic lids, those should be removed. You'll be just qualified pretty quickly if you have those items. So one pro tip I have for you, bring some extra lids to swap out at the show. I know we're all going to be really careful when we transport our honey so it stays upright, doesn't tilt and fall over and, and things like that. But even if it just tilted slightly and somehow a little bit of honey got on the top of that lid, now you've got some extra lids to swap out at the show. And then after you swap that out, make sure you polish that jar with a nylon or lint-free cloth to remove any of your fingerprints. Here's a couple simple tools that I like to use when I am preparing my show honey. As you can see here on the left, we've got these white 
um, strainers that we um, use that go on the top of your pail. They come in 600, 400, and 200 micron from most of your beekeeping supply stores. So the lower the, the, lower the number, the, um, the smaller the particles can be filtered out of your honey. So if I'm preparing show honey, I want to use that 200 micron and try to get everything out of there. And then plastic wrap. Plastic wrap is great for getting the foam off the top of that honey. So you filled your jars and you've let them kind of settle for a little while and you take that lid off and now you can put that plastic wrap, put it down and so that it touches the honey. And as you peel that off, it acts like a magnet and, and grabs all of that foam. It's really great. Here's a couple of examples of what not to do. This image here on the left, this is a single entry. So the things that I'm seeing right off the bat that um, are opportunities for improvement would be there's two different jar styles here. One is not a honey jar. We have two different types of lids, two different colors of lids, two different colors of honey. We want to make sure that all of our honey that we enter for one entry is going to be all the very same color. And then I'm seeing some underfilled jars and I'm seeing some foam on the top. So this was, at, this was likely a first time exhibitor at a county fair. And hopefully we spent some time with that person so that when they come back, they'll have a little bit more success next time around. And then this picture here on the right, those are those lot numbers that are stamped on the jar that when there's no honey in the jar or when you're washing the jar, they're almost impossible to see. Well, in 2019, when I entered my first honey show, I didn't know those numbers were there. But I got some judges feedback back on the on the sheet and he mentioned those. So I'm trying to figure out what it is. I probably even asked someone and they showed me. So I was able to immediately take that feedback from a judge in November. And when I went to my very first American Honey Show that following January, the improvement that I made was removing those numbers. And I can I attest to that being why I was successful at my very first American Honey Show as well. So one of the most valuable things you can get from a honey show is that judges feed them. Take it, read it, digest it, and apply it. And you will find that your entries improve every single time. So when you're washing your jars, you want to let them air dry and upside down so that nothing kind of falls from the air into those jars. Don't wipe them out with paper towels as that can introduce small particles of dust and fibers into the jars. So if I'm going to think about preparing for some honey shows, I might wash my jars in warm, hot, soapy water. I don't overdo it on the soap. I might do that maybe two days in advance. So then I'm ensured every last drop has dried inside that jar before I want to fill it with my show honey. So you can see here, this is our PFUN scale, and there are seven different color categories that are used, both at the American Honey Show, as well as your honey show next month. Now, when I took a look at the rules, it indicated that extracted honey is divided into subcategories by color by the show officials. You guys are lucky. At the American Honey Show, we have to figure out which shade our entries belong in. And sometimes that can be challenging. Um, so it's important to know for you guys that you can enter multiple subclasses, but you may only enter one entry per subclass. So you can enter an extra white and an amber but you can't have two entries in, in both those classes. So it can't be, well, I had this honey from this yard and this honey from this yard. So you can have up to seven entries in the extracted class if you, if you produce all those different colors. But yes, you are lucky that the show officials are going to put them in the proper um, subclass for you. So when I'm trying to figure out what subclass mine belong in, when I am... Um, preparing for the American Honey Show, I will pull out my Jack scale. Um, you can purchase this at Man Lake for about $65. And you can see here how it, it helps you determine what color that honey is needs to go in. But you guys won't need that to prepare for your honey show. So before I move on to wax, I just want to ask, does anybody have any questions about the extracted honey? Great, that was great. And there were a few questions that came in. So let's um, go to those now. So one is, how do you rate clarity for raw honey, which only strains versus a more commercial product, which heats and filters? 
So um, we are gently warming our honey and um, we are, we are um, straining it to the point that we're getting any particles out of it. So um, we're not overheating it, but we're definitely using that warmth to clarify, making sure that there are, there's no crystallization happening and there's no bubbles. Great. Thanks. And then what is an acceptable refractometer to use for the honey? Yeah. So I know there's refractometers that are, you know, every price point, just make sure that you're getting one that's specifically for honey and make sure that your honey is rating under 18.6% moisture. Now, some honey shows, as long as you're under 18.6, you get full points. Other honey shows, um, it's kind of a, a scale. So if you're at 17, you might get full points, but if you're at 18, you're a little close to the top, you might lose one point, something like that. So um, just make sure that it's rated for honey, but it certainly does not have to be one of those $400 um, digital ones. You don't have to spend that kind of money either. Great. Um, how do you remove the lot numbers? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think I learned something in January about the lot numbers. So I had filled some jars and forgotten to take them off. And I was trying to rapid dry my jars by putting them in a warm oven to kind of uh, rapidly dry them. I think it baked them on because I couldn't get them off. Okay. I don't know for sure, but that's what I'm kind of, you know, coming to the conclusion of. So when I'm getting ready to wash my jars before I let them dry, before I fill them, I actually take something like goof off or some sort of cleaner, because again, it's only touching the outside of the jar. It's not touching the inside and coming in contact with what, you know, the honey. So I just put a little bit of that and it comes right off. However, those jars that were in the oven, I couldn't get it off. So lesson learned, won't make that mistake again. Thank you. Will you talk about flavored or infused honey, especially flavors that raise the moisture content? Oh, wow. Those are good questions. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that this evening because that isn't one of the classes in your honey show. Maybe we could talk about that another time, but I wanted to make sure that in the time allotted tonight, I specifically focused on the classes for your honey show in March. Thank you. And then is there a lower limit for humidity, so moisture content? Yes, um, I think the American Honey Show, once you get down, down to maybe 14, you start to lose a point or two because, boy, <laughs> that's a pretty thick honey at that point. But um, it's pretty rare that we do see that. Fantastic. Thanks. That's all the questions that have come in so far. Great, guys. Awesome questions. All right. So we're going to move into the wax area next. And so when we're talking about... Um, preparing our beeswax entries, whether it's candles or blocks or something else, same kind of concept. Make sure that it's nice and clean. There's no foreign matter. Everything is kind of uniform in appearance, especially when we're working with beeswax. We want to make sure that there are no cracks or shrinkage. Um, the beeswax should still smell like honey. So, you know, be careful about um, how much we're heating it, things like that. And, you know, of course, the judge is going to look at the design and appearance. Is it the correct weight for that particular category? And then maybe some of those finishing details. Um, so your beeswax block category, the rules for your upcoming honey show indicate that it needs to be three uniform blocks, but they can be of any shape, but each one of those blocks must be a minimum of eight ounces. And they should be submitted on a plain white plate in a zip top bag. So those are a couple specific pieces in the rules that are very easily followed that if somebody that didn't read the rules might miss. And one um, piece of advice I would give to you that although each one of those pieces should be a minimum of eight ounces, you should make sure that each one of those pieces weighs the same, okay? And then when we get to the artistic beeswax, one exhibit in this class is at least 16 ounces and it must be 100% beeswax. It can be more than one piece, but it should be firmly joined together. So think about when the judge is evaluating it, nothing should fall apart, nothing should fall off. Make sure it's firmly held together. Now in your artistic beeswax, it can be molded or carved, but make sure that you don't add any non-beeswax enhancements. So no jewelry for your artistic beeswax, okay? 
So then when we talk about the candle class, um, you guys only have to provide one candle. It can be molded or carved, but it must be a minimum of eight ounces and it should be 100% beeswax. So you do need a little bit bigger candle here to achieve that eight ounce minimum weight. Um, although your rules don't indicate, I'd recommend trimming that wick to a half an inch, but definitely make sure that that bottom is nice and flat and that your wick is properly centered. That's gonna be looked at by the judge. And it looks like in your rules, uh, your candles will be lit during the judging to see how they perform. So again, just like with your liquid honey, plan ahead. It takes time to filter and clarify that wax. Um, you might have to pour the same thing 10 times to get a really good um, unmold. Uh, I find wax to be very challenging. I, I don't think I'm very good at it. I know how to judge it well, but I definitely have to practice a whole lot more to get some excellent exhibits. Um, but I just keep practicing. Um, but time is your friend, just like with your liquid honey. Don't try to do this the night before. You're not going to have as much fun. And unfortunately, things like a larger block just might not have the time they need to cool down to be ready for an exhibit. So when I am filtering and clarifying or straining my, um, my wax, Here's a list of some of the equipment that I use in order to do that. I like using an old nylon curtain or some pantyhose uh, to you know, try to strain any material out of any uh, debris out of that wax. I don't stir my wax while I'm melting it um, because that'll cause any of that debris that kind of was settling at the bottom. It gets it, you know, flying around in there. We don't want that. Um, make sure you're using a cotton candle wick for your candles. The mold, mold manufacturer will identify the correct size to use for that mold, and I would suggest um, sticking with that. Always make sure that your wax is fully cooled before removing from the mold. And so the larger the mold, the larger the piece of wax, the longer it's going to take to fully cool. So let's talk about a few things of what not to do. Please don't put beeswax in a microwave. Beeswax is highly flammable. I don't want to see anybody have any um, accidents with their house. We don't add scents or colors to our beeswax. On occasion, there may be a honey show that will specifically allow for a little bit of dye to be used in maybe an artistic category, but that's not the case for your upcoming honey show. Be careful not to spill the wax in your kitchen. Don't ask me how I know. Um, Try to work on keeping the airflow from, you know, going over your blocks or your or candles while they're cooling um, and try to prevent things from having to cool too quickly. So airflow over your blocks of wax will cause ripples. When you're pouring your wax, pour it evenly and don't let it splash. Don't pour it too slow either. That was a mistake I was making in the beginning. And I noticed these weird kind of ridges that were going up the side. Well, that's because Every time that wax that I was pouring too slow was hitting the side and actually starting to cool from touching the side of the mold, it was creating these, these strange ripples. So now I pour more quickly, um, but I try to do it very evenly and not splashing. Beeswax that cools too rapidly will have high shoulders and often long, deep cracks and will become sunken or concave on the surface. If a block won't release from its mold, Try to place it in, in a freezer for 10 or 15 minutes and see if that will help. It kind of shrinks up just a little bit. And it should still have that wonderful honey aroma. It shouldn't smell of mold release or anything else. So just be careful of that because the judge will be sniffing your wax, okay? So here's some pro tips. Get yourself a scale. You know, weigh those items. Make sure that they weigh what they're supposed to weigh for the class. And if you're entering multiple pieces in a class, that they all weigh the same. Make sure you polish that up. Use silk or a nylon cloth. If you get a little bloom, use a hairdryer. Just be gentle with it so that you don't um, affect the shape and cause any melting. But that bloom goes away pretty quick. Now, one thing I like to do when I'm using a new mold is I practice with it. I perform a bunch of sample pours. And then I can I can handle those. Those, um, whether it's a black, whether it's a candle, I can look at them, I can see how the mold performs. Is it doing what I want it to do? Is there any defects? I can weigh it without worrying about, you know, damaging something that potentially was um, a show quality uh, mold. So um, definitely play around with some of those molds and get used to them. Here's a picture of how I um, pour my candles. 
Uh, this particular shelf was based off the plans from Gary Ruder from Minnesota. Um, and I will have a link to that at the end of my presentation. As you can see, there are slits cut out so that the wicks can go through the bottom and those candles can sit um, flat on that shelf because the bottom of the mold is actually the top of the candle, okay? Also, you'll notice in this picture, there are two different types of wick holders. It doesn't really matter, just as long as you're using something uh, that will hold that wick centered and upright until that wax hardens. Now, something that you don't see in the picture, I probably have it off to the side, is my little level. I am making sure that those molds are level before I'm pouring that so that the bottom of my candle will be nice and flat and level. And I took this picture in my garage. So in uh, the summer and the fall, when it's really warm out and it's kind of warm and stuffy in my garage, that's a great time to pour some candles so that they cool very slowly versus doing it inside where the air conditioning is on. Uh, so think about you know, some of those things that you can do to, to slow down the cooling. So here is a, a honey show that's being judged at a county fair. And you can see a variety of different types of candles here and styles and molds and so forth. But I want to point out to you um, these beautiful lemon colored pillars here in the center. That is the color that you want to aim for. That is what you want to see at a honey show. Now this judge is holding my candle here. It's not nearly as pretty. This is probably the first time I entered a honey show uh, in a wax category. Candles are perfectly fine and I'm sure my customers would love to burn those. Um, but obviously I used too much heat when I was preparing those. Well, maybe I poured them 10,000 times and they just got heated too many times. So I really wanna focus on trying to get this nice um, canary or lemon yellow. And uh, that can be achieved by using wax cappings and, and making sure you um, don't overdo the heat, okay? Here's another picture. This was at the Heartland Apiculture Society meeting two years ago. I apologize, the lighting on this isn't great um, because of a window, of course, but I wanted to still show you, we've got a number of different types of wax entries here on this table. But specifically, look at this artistic beeswax entry here. Look at the bright, beautiful yellow color here. This is what you're aiming for. This is what you want. It's hard to achieve, um, but, but work at it. This candle here, this pillar, I believe this one placed very high. Those sides were totally smooth. That wick was perfectly centered and that bottom was nice and flat. So that's what you're looking for when it comes to you know, your candle entries. So your beeswax is gonna be judged for color, aroma, cleanliness, casting or molding flaws, and then does it conform with the rules? So here we've got a couple different shades of beeswax here. This is all perfectly acceptable beeswax, but again, look at this bright lemon yellow. That's what our goal is for a honey show. So here's some examples of some flaws. Um, this uh, yellow block here, it looks to me, this brown stuff, it looks like there's probably still a little bit of honey in here. So we can work at you know cleaning that up a little bit. Um, I'm also seeing some edges that are not nice and crisp. Over here, um, this is a little bit dark. This is probably some brood wax and I see some cracking. So that's, that's probably not what we wanna use for a honey show. Uh, this white wax, I wouldn't think this is beeswax. It's awful light. That's not what we're looking for. Um, so I would suggest not bringing something of that color to a honey show. Down here, color is decent, um, but you can see a big crack in the middle and we can see some high shoulders. It's kind of got concave. And this tells me that this entry cooled too fast. So what are some strategies that I can use to slow the cooling down? How can I, how can I cool it as slow as possible? I try something different all the time. I haven't found the silver bullet yet, but I'm gonna keep trying. And then here, this, this one here in the lower right, although the, you know, the wax is a little dark, I really wanted you to see, this is what the ripples look like. And these ripples happen when there's airflow going over your wax as it's cooling. So how can we um, eliminate the, those ripples in that airflow, okay? So here's some pro tips. When it comes to heat, less is more. Heat it slowly and cool it slowly. That's how you're gonna have beautiful wax entries. 
but it definitely takes some practice. So again, we talked about um, what your blocks rules are and your artistic rules are. Make sure you adhere to those size requirements, weight requirements. Some honey shows even have a thickness requirement, but I didn't see that in your rules. But the manner of submission is in your rules as well. We covered that on a previous slide. So print those rules, highlight that, read it a few times so that you make sure that you hit all of those notes. So candles, same thing. You know, we, we kind of covered your entry is going to be one candle and it can be molded or carved, a minimum of eight ounces, 100% beeswax, and it will be lit. So all of the things that we, you know, are looking for on this slide was pretty much covered in your rules, okay? So here's a few samples of some different varieties of candles. On the far left, we've got molded tapers, then we've got some hand-dipped tapers, uh, then we have some kind of artistic molded candles. You know, some of these may not weigh that minimum of eight ounces. So you're going to want to work with some of the molds that you have and make sure that you're getting that minimum of eight ounces. What's nice for your honey show is you only have to turn in one candle, though. So that means you don't have to make sure that both candles are identical. So that's kind of nice. And of course, we have floating candles and rolled candles. And I think you'll have a really hard time getting eight ounces uh, when it comes to a floating or rolled candle. But I just wanted to show you what some of the options are. And, um, different honey shows have different criteria. So just make sure that we're not adulterating our wax in any way. 100% pure beeswax, use those cappings, um, use your solar wax melter this summer so that you have some great wax ready for next year. Uh, but certainly you can, um, you can work with your wax now, even if you can't use your solar wax melter uh, currently. So before we move on to the chunk and comb honey, does anybody have any questions for me on the wax? Great, thanks. So we have a question to back up a little bit to honey. Can okay. you talk a little bit about the black jar honey contests and how they work? Yes, black jar are great. And I mentioned at one of my first slides that all of us beekeepers should be able to enter an extracted honey contest. Well, that's even double for a black jar contest because often you only need to have about four ounces of honey and it is solely judged on the flavor alone. So you don't have to make sure it's in a pretty jar. You don't have to make sure all the bubbles are out of it. You don't have to strain the heck out of it. In fact, that's why they call it a black jar. They either, the show will provide you with a black jar to put that honey in or they'll require you to have covered your jar in some way. And so it's strictly on flavor alone. And I'll tell you what, if those aren't the best bragging rights to have, that I have the best tasting honey. So uh, just to get a little bit off, off topic, uh, the Center for Honey Bee Research does have an international black jar contest. Entries are due by the end of this month, so there's not a lot of time left. Um, but I heard about this particular contest from our friend Chris Beck, uh, who won the best tasting honey in the world. I think it might have been in 2019. And he won, he won a great prize for that. And so I entered after hearing about the contest from him. And in 2021, I was able to have the best tasting honey in the United States. And I'll tell you what, I was real obnoxious with all of my bragging about that. So it's only $10 to enter. That particular contest, you do have to send three pounds in because they actually sell the leftover honey to fundraise for the Center for Honey Bee Research. So it's 10 bucks, three pounds of honey, goes to a good cause. And, and it's an amazing. So check out that website if you get a chance after the presentation is over. But I will say that your honey show in March does not have a black jar category, but keep that in mind for any other shows. Fantastic. Thank you. We're all caught up in questions now. Okay, so we're going to move into the chunk and comb honey categories. So if you didn't kind of prepare for this, it might be a little bit harder for you to have an entry for March. But I want you to keep all of this in mind, even if you can't do it this time. Hopefully you can work over the summer to, to um, produce some comb and chunk honey so that you can enter in next year's event. So as with our extracted honey and our wax, it's still very important to make sure everything is uniform, everything is clean, everything is filled to the level it's supposed to be. There's no crystallization, there's no foreign material, no bubbles. All of that same stuff applies. But then when we get into the chunk and the comb, you know, what's the appearance and quality of that comb? Are they, is everything fully capped? Are the edges nice and neat? Things like that. So um, 
especially when we get into the cut comb, making sure that we don't have any leakage inside those containers, making sure that our cappings are nice and white and clean. Okay, so your chunk honey class um, requires three one pound glass cylinder jars with small shoulders. So for chunk honey, you can't really use the queen line or plastic jars just because that mouth isn't wide enough to be able to put that chunk in. Okay, so keep that in mind, different jars, but still three of them. So these three jars should match and the lid should match, but they're not the same as your classic and queen line. And then when we get into your comb honey category, um, you can do a round section, cassette, or cup comb, and they should be in three identical containers and both sides should be transparent. So you can't hide the bad side and only sh show the pretty side. The judge wants to see both sides of that. And then the full frame category, it's one full frame. It should be in a display case that both sides are transparent as well. So when you get into your comb section, honey, those can be in removable cardboard boxes. When you're talking about comb section, honey, and your full frame of honey, the wood and the wood on the frame, those should be clean too. So make sure that you don't have propolis on them. Make sure that there's any burr comb has been taken off. Make sure that um, things aren't dripping. When we talk about um, the all of the section comb honey, you know, the, um, the rounds and the cut comb and all that, when you have to turn in three, um, three containers, make sure that they all weigh the same or as close to the same as possible. So you might have several of containers of them and you're going to be weighing them to try to get those that weigh closest. So same thing. There's a lot of planning ahead when it comes to comb honey because I'm probably going to want to use um, fresh frames and fresh wood. And, and I mean, I have to plan for this already probably back in April and May to make sure that I'm, I'm getting um, that um, wireless thin surplus foundation put in those frames or, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> when you're using comb in your, uh, in your chunk honey, Make sure that all the pieces are cut from the same frame. You want to make sure that that color is consistent. When you're cutting chunk or cut comb section, use a very sharp knife. You can wipe that knife clean between each cut. Even warm that knife a bit. Okay. The general requirements for both section and cut comb are the same. All comb honey must be produced on new, thin, unwired foundation and when finished must be fully capped on both sides. Free from cells containing pollen and with no signs of small hive beetle or wax moth damage. Comb honey should be produced during a good nectar flow to ensure quick and even drawing, filling and capping of the comb. And you should be removing those from the hive as soon as it is ready to minimize the, minimize the risk of travel staining. On removal from the hive, comb honey should be sealed in an airtight container and placed in the freezer for at least 24 hours. This will prevent small hive beetle and wax moth eggs from hatching and later spoiling the exhibit. Same thing goes for what you're selling to your customers. This will also prevent that crystallization too. Just make sure you're allowing your comb to defrost thoroughly before removing it from the airtight container. So that's preventing condensation. Uh, make sure that your containers have transparent lids, both sides, um, and then <clears throat> your wood sections and frames should be thoroughly cleaned of any dirt and propolis, and no plastic foundation for your full frame entries, okay? So we kind of talked about this slide, what not to do. Same concept when you're entering your chunk honey. Make sure your jars match, your lids match, they're clean, all that fun stuff, okay? So here's another example of what not to do. So I want to draw your attention to um, the image of chunk honey here on the left. Make sure the chunk is not floating and it is cut to the proper height to be at the fill line. Make sure to use the same color strained honey that's in the chunk. So that means you probably want to harvest both at the same time. Make sure the cells are facing the correct direction. And the comb should represent at least 50% of the total honey and be in one single piece. So what I'm seeing in this image here, yep, it's one single piece. 
it's floating a little bit, but it probably is more than 50% of, you know, the total honey in the jar. So we've got matching lids, the jars look nice and clean. So there's a lot of good things about this exhibit. But what I really wanted to illustrate in this picture is look at the direction of the comb, okay? So this one here in her right hand, you can see that the chevrons are placed, facing down or they're making a V like this. That is how they should be placed in the jar. That is how the bees create them. That's so that the nectar doesn't roll out before they're able to cure that honey down. This, this jar here, it looks like this comb was put in upside down. And you can see the chevrons are facing up. And so they're, they're not in the right direction. So this picture was taken solely so I could show you guys the difference instead of try to explain it with just words, okay? And then when we look at this picture here on the right of this comb, um, I see a little bit of leakage in the, in the container and those edges could be a little bit crisper. So there's some opportunities for improvement there and that just comes with practice, okay? Make sure you drain your cut comb and your comb sections so that there isn't any leakage in that package. You want that to be nice and, and dry and neat, okay? So we talk about wet cappings versus dry capping. So this picture of um, basswood section here on the left, that's what's considered to be a wet capping. There's nothing wrong with it necessarily. There just isn't an air bubble between the honey and the wax. The honey is directly touching the wax and that's what we call a wet capping. This might've been on the hive too long or maybe the bees just didn't add that air bubble for whatever reason. But when we look at this Ross round here on the right, look at that bright, white, heavily mapping. That's really what we're looking for in Honey Show. And the Killians who hold, who held the world, they probably still hold the world record for comb honey. They specifically bred their queens for the bright, white, heavily cappings. Okay, that's how serious they were about their comb honey. So here we're going to talk about the full frame. Um, these should have been on new wired foundations, preferably fitted in a new frame. Uh, the frame chosen to be exhibited should be evenly drawn and well capped. It should be heavy for its size. The honey in the frame should all be of one color with no signs of crystallization, and there should be no cells containing pollen or other debris. The capping should be clean and even without dips or hollows. Um, and the, and clear of the woodwork, making the uncapping an easy process. So that means, you know, a nice fat drawn out um, frame so that you can really get those cappings cut off nicely. But be careful it's not too fat that it doesn't fit in your display case, okay? Um, travel staining and weeping will penalize the exhibit. Once the frame has been chosen, it must be um, scraped clean of all dirt, propolis, burr comb, et cetera, before being placed in the showcase. The case should be easily opened, allowing the judge to remove the frame for inspection. So a couple of things about this. Um, when I look at this top left one, although it's, you know, a beautiful case and all, uh, you know, there's a little work that could be done here. We've got some propolis here on the wood. We've got some burr comb. But, you know, once I try to clear up, clean up some of this burr comb, I'm probably going to have some leakage. You know, so, you know, those are some things to consider. I look at uh, these lower ones here on the right. Boy. Those look pretty, pretty nice. Something also to consider, all of these cases are going to look different. Unfortunately, there are no plans on the internet, at least none that I could find when I looked and looked and looked. Um, there's really nobody that commercially produces these. And so you'll find a handful of people, if you really find someone that will build them, they often charge a lot of money for these cases. So if you're a beekeeper that's handy in the wood shop, you can build a few of these and kind of tinker with and, and work on your design and find one that works really well for you. I had a I had a non beekeeper friend build me one, and there's things that we would have done differently if he had, would have really fully understood what what I was trying to do here. Even though I did explain it, you know, not being a beekeeper, not being a competitor, he still didn't really quite fully understand. But it's important to to make note that the case should be open should be able to be open and that it should be clear on both sides. So I've seen people make the mistake of having an absolutely beautiful frame of honey, um, but they just threw the top down of a very simple case. And so the judge could open it to be able to inspect it better. 
I also saw a youth beekeeper. It just warmed my heart to see a youth beekeeper bring a full frame to the fair. And unfortunately, the case they built, the front was clear, but the back, the back was not clear. Um, so we, I tracked that little guy down and, and really worked with him on, on trying to make sure that he brought, brought an entry back next year and had his dad, you know, fix the back, you know, because again, we can always hide the ugly side and show the pretty side, um, but we want to make sure that the judge can see both sides. Okay. So again, the cappings should be complete and uniform, white and powdery. Um, it's preferred to have um, um, dry cappings to wet cappings, but we don't want to have leakage in the containers. You know, make sure that comb is, is drawn out evenly. Sometimes we'll see some comb honey where we can see the the foundation and one side is pulled out way more than the other side. And so that's unbalanced. Uh, look at these frames, look at this white capping. I don't know about you guys, my bees have never made beautiful captains like that. Um, you know, but maybe maybe it's some read of bees. I don't know, maybe it's me leaving my frames in too long, but you know, so there's, those are some things to aspire to. So again, when we're talking about the comb honey, just make sure things are nice and clean and then the cappings are bright white and that they're fully capped and that we're making sure that we're using the right containers and that we've got uniformity of weight. You know, so all of that stuff, you know, I think you're probably starting to hear, um, you know, some things that that are consistent throughout this presentation. So again, this, this uh, example of chunk honey, it's in the right jar, you know, it's not floating much. You know, I can see, I can see pretty even drawing here in the mid rib. Um, the chevrons are facing the right direction. You know, this is a really great um, entry. So hopefully you guys can um, put together some that look this, this good too. And again, we just covered all that kind of stuff here as well. So here are some examples of what not to do. Uh, this one here on the far left, it's a few different chunks and they're kind of facing all different directions. So you want to avoid that. This one here in the middle doesn't quite have enough comb in it. Um, and then this one here on the far right, you know, it's uncapped with no honey in that chunk of wax. So we want to make sure that the wax that's in, or the chunk that's in there is capped and there's honey in those cells, okay? So a couple different um, examples here. We've got our cut comb. We've got our round raw sections. We've got our basswood um, sections. And then I think this is probably a cassette as well. So these are some examples of your your, your comb and your suction honey. Here's a couple more examples examples of some common errors. We've got we've got um, a basswood section here that isn't fully capped. Same with the Ross round underneath it. And then we've got some here that we've got some leakage, and then this bottom one here on the right that's not in in the correct container. Um, so just kind of think about that as well. You know, we've kind of talked about this full frame. It's one full frame of capped honey in a protective casing that you can see through both sides and it should be accessible. Um, but again, you see all of these cases are different because all of these people have to build their own because there isn't anything consistent out on the market. Um, so before I go into the last couple um, categories that you guys have, do you have any questions for me with the, the comb hunt? We have a question that probably applies to most categories. So it's when you enter your product in the competition for any category, do the entrants get a copy of all the judging criteria you discussed? So most honey shows, you will get um, a judge's feedback sheet back. So you'll be able to see where you might have lost points and why the judges will give you some good notes. So that is the most valuable thing to get from a honey show besides that blue ribbon, of course, is hearing that feedback from that judge so that you know you know where you lost points and you know how and where you can improve on. Um, so I learned from another competitor, her response was, you know, um, I don't like to enter in a honey show where I'm not gonna get judges feedback. So um, I'm sure that you guys will probably get judges feedback from your event because I know that Chris is coordinating it and Chris is gonna do an amazing job. And so um, he, he knows the value of that feedback for you guys. Um, sometimes those county fairs, unfortunately, you know, you don't get judges feedback. And, and you know, I try to treat some of my county fairs as maybe my warm-ups. 
before the big, the big one shows because county fairs don't always judge the same standards just because they don't have certified county judges. Or something. Hopefully that answered your question. Thanks. And I, I think there was a clarification. So do you get the rubric before you submit the entries? Oh, so um, the rubric or so like here, this, um, this scorecard, that's probably not included in uh, the rules, but often when you read the rules, it'll say here are the things that you're being judged on. Again, county fairs are not good at putting that in their fair books and their premium books. And so sometimes you kind of have to learn the hard way by, by actually participating in a honey show. Um, but your rules are quite good um, in each one of those class specific rules. As I read them, it's listed. Here's what you're going to be judged on for this. Here's what you're going to be judged on for this. So it might not be in a bullet point format, but if you read closely, um, they tell you exactly what you're going to be judged on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So creamed honey, all the same stuff with your liquid honey. You know, make sure that the jars are clean. You've got them in the right jars. The lids match. Everything's, you know, in good condition. Uh, the difference here with the creamed honey is, you know, it's kind of a balance between making sure that your set is not too loose and not too firm. So the judge is going to take that lid off and they're going to tilt it and they're going to see how much give there is. Is it kind of starting to run out or, you know, does it not budge at all? However long I hold it this way. So, you know, that's that small amount of movement, that small amount of, of um, bulge, they call it, is good. Um, so yeah, you want to work on practicing, um, a not too loose of a set, but not too firm of a set either, but you still got to make sure that everything is nice and clean and there's no foam and you've got it to the fill line, all of those kind of things. You guys have a baked goods class. Uh, so you want to definitely make sure that, you know, you've got good texture and moisture and it smells good and the flavor. But remember, guys, this is a honey show. So the most important thing for your baked goods is the influence of honey in your finished product. So you, in a honey show, you want to make sure that your baked goods taste like honey. This is different than your county fair where they're going to be prioritizing other things um, for your baked goods. Um, but here, specifically at a honey show, that's going to be the first thing that the judge is going to look at, do I taste that honey? What is the influence? So looking at the rules for your upcoming honey show, an entry is six pieces or servings. So if you're going to make cookies, make sure there's six cookies on the plate. Okay. You're also required to provide a typed copy of the list of ingredients. Now, mind you, it just said the list of ingredients. It does not require you to have the full recipe with the measurements and all of the um, steps or the process it took to prepare that, but other honey shows will require that. So just, again, I'm just going back to reading the rules and make sure that you understand all those tiny little details. And for your baked goods, your entry should be submitted on a plain white plate in a zip top bag or in a plain baker's box. So, you know, one thing that I learned with baked goods and honey shows, it's, you know, when we're wanting to focus on the influence of honey in this baked good, it's recommended to, you know, avoid some ingredients that might overshadow or um, kind of take away from that influence of honey. So sometimes too much lemon, too much cinnamon, too many, you know, nuts might drown that honey flavor out. Um, not always, but Maybe you want to practice like those special cookies that you like that have honey in it. Maybe you want to make them a couple times between now and March 1st so that uh, you really have got that recipe down pat. But make sure that all of those pieces or servings on that plate, they should be uniform in size. They should be nice and tidy. Um, everything should look good um, and be uniform. So some elements to consider in that baked category. Um, your, your visual appeal, including the color and presentation, the aroma, the flavor, the crumb or texture, moisture, doneness. You know, is it is it raw in the middle or is it a little bit dark on the edges? Um, and of course, most importantly, is that influence of honey. Okay. 
So make sure you consult those show rules. How is the entry supposed to be presented? Well, we covered that on that plate. How many examples of servings constitute an entry? We covered that, six. And what type of container or plate is the entry supposed to be on? We covered that, a plain white one. So it sounds to me like you guys need to go out and buy some nice white paper plates and some of those nice big gallon Ziploc bags so that you can um, submit some of your entries in those things. Um, that way you're not running around the night before the honey show trying to put that together. Hit that, hit the grocery store this weekend and put some of those um, supplies in. So here's an image of the classes that are going to be in your honey show coming up in March. You know, so we talked about the extracted honey and the chunked honey and the combed honey, creamed honey, and then your, of course, your beeswax blocks artistic beeswax candles in your big goods. So there's a really nice variety of classes in your upcoming honey show. Like I said in the beginning, I hope you'll at least enter one of them, but enter more if you can. It's really just a lot of fun. So in summary, you know, it's really important to start preparing early. You still have time to put together several entries before your honey show, but I wouldn't wait until the week of to pour my liquid honey, okay? I'd probably get working on getting that poured this week. Review those rules, print them, highlight them, hang them on the fridge, look at them a number of times. You know, get yourself a good light. Get a high lumen flashlight so that you can shine it through your jars of honey and look for any particles. Um, you can either shine, you can even shine it through some of your beeswax entries to make sure there, you know, wasn't a piece of dirt somewhere in there. And just make sure that you're having fun. It's all about having fun. You know, in summary, you know, the judging and, and exhibiting at a honey show might be more involved than you first believed. And you, you might be going, oh my gosh, she just talked about a lot of stuff. But I want you to think back to when you started beekeeping. Is it beekeeping a whole lot more involved than you thought when you got started? And just, just kind of think about that. So my last slide here, I'd recommend, uh, you know, grab your phone and take a picture of this one. These are some resources that I have found helpful in my quest for um, uh, learning more about being a better competitor. Uh, so APA Solutions Consortium has some resources there. They're not as active as they used to be. Um, the Kansas honey producers, since COVID, have been doing this great extracting more dollars from your hives. Uh, a couple of their recordings does have um, some stuff specific to you know harvesting and preparing and even in some honey show stuff. So take a look at those. Any of Virginia Webb's videos, that should be your go-to. Um, she is she is the goat and she knows what she's doing. So that's definitely where you want to get started. The University of Florida Honeybee Lab, they did a YouTube video a couple of years ago specifically to prepare for their honey show at Bee College. But a lot of that information will translate over. You might pick up on a couple more tips that I maybe didn't share today. Gary's Honeybee page. So Gary Ruder from the University of Minnesota. That's where I got the plans for my um, shelf that I used to pour my wax molds. And then, of course, the American Honey Show Training Council. So that's got a lot of um, information about honey shows, how to become a honey judge, um, honey shows that are going on around the country in case you get um, really excited about it and want to do more than just the one in your state and so forth. So that's the end of my slide. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen. And um, I would love to hear any more questions that you might have. Great, thank you. That was fantastic. So we have another question. Are creamed honeys typically naturally creamed or whipped? Okay, so um, there's, a, there's a lot of different um, terminology there and people will call creamed honey whipped and spawn and all of those things. Um, for the purposes of a honey show, the creamed honey that you're going to want to exhibit would be those that you have controlled the crystallization process, um, whether you have a machine or whether you are um, stirring it by hand and controlling that temperature to get the smallest um, crystal grain that you possibly can. When we're talking about naturally crystallized honey, I have seen one honey show um, in the United States that did have um, a naturally set class, um, I need to learn a little bit more about that one. So for the purposes of most honey shows in your honey show, you know, that creamed honey, that's kind of like that nice butter consistency. Great. 
Thank you. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I have a question for you based off my recent experience and realizing how I was not prepared to transport or can or handle my entries. Um, so I was wondering if you have any tips and tricks for how you safely get your entries to the competition or to the show. Oh, that's such a great question. I can't believe I don't have a slide on that. Thank you, Anna. So yeah, it can be challenging. So when it comes to my, my liquid honey or my honey that's in jars, I happen to have this really nice sturdy box that my sister built for me before I was even a beekeeper because I'm also a canner. And so she didn't want my, my jars to roll around in the car. And so what I do is I put them in that box. They're upright. I set that on the floor so it's not going to slide off my seat. Um, they're going to stay upright. And I just try not to drive like a maniac. Okay. Um, certainly you don't need the box that my sister built me. You can use the box that your honey jars came in. Um, just carry them nice and flat. Everything you can do to keep them flat and from not tipping. So then when we get to things like our baked goods and our wax and so forth, you know, if it's a candle, you know, you can wrap it in um, that white foamy packing material that's like a sheet. You can kind of wrap it in that nice and gentle and then maybe then, then put something like a towel around it and pack it really nice in a box so it's not going to move around and get dense. Be careful about your fingernails. So easy to knit um, one of your wax entries with a fingernail, right? So I sometimes will quickly trim my fingernails before I'm going to a honey show so I don't make that mistake. Uh, the reason I thought of that is because I remember this poor woman, she had a tear in her eye because she had the most beautiful entry and she nicked it on her way there. Okay. Um, sometimes like your, your bigger items, like if you have a bigger block or something like that, I've heard people use even some of those cake transporters, you know, so it's, it's in this dome and it's got a handle and so nothing's touching it. It's nice and protected. Um, let's see, what else can we do? Um, definitely with your baked goods, you're going to want to find a way that they're not sliding around in that container. Um, and, the, you know, and again, we want to make sure it's safe for the judge, too. So we want to make sure that, you know, food safety is is a priority. If it's something that needed to be refrigerated, we handle that properly. We don't bake it two weeks before the event, then bring it, you know, some of those things, too. Um, so, yeah, packing and packing safely. So, again, planning ahead. Don't be so rushed that you didn't pack your things nice and safe, you know, because listen, I make the mistake. So my sister decided to be my assistant this year in January. I did a few honey shows and she was like, get out of my way. I'm packing this for you because I just wanted to pack it and get going. And she's like, nope, you know, so um, yeah, that's really something to think of. But I know that my, um, my friends that compete a lot, uh, they will use that white foamy packing material um, to wrap their wax in because it's not going to make any dents or dings or anything. Now, that's all fine and dandy when you can drive to a honey show. What do you do when you have to fly? That's a whole nother nightmare, right? And so I love to go to honey shows that I can drive to. And yes, I drive really far sometimes, but I'd rather have control over my honey. I don't want TSA touching my honey. I don't want UPS touching my honey because they're not going to treat it as well as I would treat it. And I don't know what kind of mess I'm going to get when I get to the other side. So, but it can be done. Um, it has to be checked in, in your checked baggage and you know how rough they are on that. Um, but yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully those are some, some tips that will help in transport on them. Thank you. I have another question and maybe I missed it. Do you use mold release for your candle entries or do you have yeah. thoughts on whether not to use it? Yeah. So I know sometimes people will buy some of the silicone release from like the car store or the car, you know, like Napa or whatever. Um, don't use that because it can leave kind of this like WD-40 smell or something like that. So they do sell candle uh, mold release specifically for candles. I do use it on molds that I found that don't release well. But on those molds, like you saw in my picture where it was that heavy duty, um, uh, silicone, they release really well from those. But when I'm doing my big blocks, and sometimes I'm doing that like in a bread pan, that's metal, it doesn't release as well. So you bet I do use some old release, but I use it sparingly, because I don't want to leave any kind of chemical sheen on that wax. I don't want to leave any odor behind. So I am careful with how much I use. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Well, that wraps it up. I think we got to all of the questions. 
This was fantastic. I want to thank you for spending your time sharing all your tips and tricks. I mean, we know you're, we're your competition, so it's very nice of you to share everything that you've learned with us. And I really hope that people enter the Spring Conference Honey Show. I think it'll be really fun for us here in Michigan if we have a lot of entries. And um, I think one of the main things is just, you know, go for it. It doesn't have to be like you're going for a blue ribbon. Just try it out and learn from the feedback. Everybody's got to start somewhere, right, Anna? You know, and, and uh, you know, you just learn so much. And, and thank you for having me. So although some people here, here might be my competition, but it just keeps, it just raises the bar for all of us. And my goal is to see more people compete in the show. So if, if, you know, having these talks will, will increase entries, then I will just keep doing it. So thank you. Anna. Thank you. And we will see you at the spring conference here in East Lansing. I look forward to it. You guys have the best conference. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.